Hello and welcome to Off the Fence, a podcast where we deconstruct difficult decision making to help find out what keeps us stuck and more importantly, how do we get unstuck? I'm your host, Karen Covey, a former divorce lawyer, mediator, and arbitrator turned coach, author, and entrepreneur. With me today is Beverly Price. Beverly Price has 25 plus years experience as a CDC certified divorce coach, women's empowerment, pre-mediation coach, and podcast host. She provides knowledge, support, and insight to empower women get go, women who are going through divorce in the divorce process, both before, during, and after. She guides them through all the emotional, legal, financial, educational, organizational, and logistical challenges that come with divorce. She provides one-on-one -on -one coaching across the U.S. to address a woman's unique desire for fulfilling for a fulfilling life designed just the way she wants it. Beverly is also the host of her Empowered Divorce podcast with industry leading guests focusing on supporting a woman's divorce journey. She has a personal history with divorce, co-parenting, domestic violence, multiple marriages, being a single working mother and more. Combining this personal experience with her training, professional certifications and business knowledge, Beverly can help women by supporting them along their grief journey helping them to work through resentments, fear, sadness, and shock. Prior to divorce coaching, Beverly was a senior executive in the corporate world of financial services for over 15 years. Beverly, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Karen. It's an honor to be here. I am so excited. And if you don't mind, I want to just dive in and jump into the, the you go biggest for it. burning question that I have, which is- okay. What has your divorce journey been? Can you share a little bit of your story with the audience? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's a hard one. Um, it starts with marriage number one. It goes to marriage number two, marriage number three, marriage number four, all four ending in divorce. Mm -hmm. And you might say, why? Or you might drop your jaw as some people do when they hear that. Well, what I learned after intense personal work is that I was raised and driven to attention as my definition of success in life, as my definition of being a good girl, was that if I got attention, if I got praise, that I was good. So what did I do? I turned to a man that gave me that attention. And then when I didn't feel better about me, I ended that marriage and went to the next. And guess who I was attracted to? Another man that gave me attention and then on to another and another. And it took me learning that this was a deep seated need of me. It was almost like I had a hole in my soul and I tried to have men or marriage fill it up to make me feel better. And what I learned is that nobody can make me feel better except myself. And so when I encountered <clears throat> a very direct husband, he said to me, Beverly, you make everybody's life miserable that you come into contact with. And normally I would have lashed back in a skinny minute. And instead I had to agree. I had to say, you know, he was right. And that put me on a journey of deep digging, uh, deep personal self-awareness, and a lot of hard work to become a totally different person who is now in a very happy, healthy, surviving marriage. Who can, and, and the inspiration I want to give to people is it can change and it sure can get better if you're willing to do the work. That. That's quite a story. And, you know, if you can, if I can just take you back a little bit to that moment where, you know, your husband was very direct and said, you yeah. know, he's life miserable. Why didn't you lash back that time? What changed in you that allowed you to make a different choice to, to have a different reaction? Um, hmm, that I've never been asked that question before. I think it was maybe coming face to face with myself and my reality and finally making the decision that I had to do something about me. And it's that core decision that you have. Do you stay entrenched 
with what's comfortable, even if it's bad? Or do you step out into the unfamiliar, but you know it's going to be good? And so that decision, I think, was the pivoting point for me. And that decision, I mean, first, I want to applaud you for making the decision and for sharing it, right? Because Mm -hmm. that's a really courageous decision to make. You've got to be willing to own your own stuff. So oh, yeah. Yeah. And- but the beauty of that, you know, Karen, is that I believe you can find good in most things, not everything, but the good I can find is that was a springboard for me to help other women, to study, to learn, to uh, find a connection with them and really be able to guide them through what I went through, because back when I went through it, there weren't divorce coaches to help. There weren't people that could guide you. And so what I can do is I can take all of that pain and I can take all of those lessons and give it to another woman so that she can come through her journey more whole and more complete. That is really, really powerful. Um, And it sounds like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like that was your inspiration for. Doing- oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when in your work as a divorce coach, um, what do you think, maybe this isn't a fair question, but what do you think is the <laughs> most important uh, lesson for women to learn if they want to not just get through their divorce, but put themselves in a position to do what you did after your last divorce, which is change and grow and get the relationship they really want? I think it's the fearless choice of self-awareness. And and I'm not talking just superficial self-awareness. I'm talking deep self-awareness. If you become willing to dig deep and look at yourself, then you can not only navigate your divorce, but you can launch yourself on a much more fulfilling life afterwards. But if you continue to want to be the you you've always been, as they say, you're going to get what you've always got. 100%. But how do you, how do you, as a woman, let's say I, you know, I've been, I come to you as a client, how do I even start? How do I even know what to do? I Because I think a lot of people have the desire to change, but they don't know what that, what that really means, or how do I get from where I am now to where I want to be, which is in that relationship full of love and contentment and peace and all the things. Absolutely. Well, there's, that's one of the reasons a coach is such a good guide is based on where you are. And remember that everybody comes at a different place. You know, I may come full of anger and rage, or I may come with a victim mentality, or I may come with extreme guilt and shame. And so depending on where you are really affects the plan we would put in place to get you there. If I am strictly, let's say, or if I'm a victim of domestic violence, God forbid, but I was, you have, you would take one whole process there versus if I'm a woman that decided that I'd been living my life, hoping for change, hoping the relationship would change, realizing that maybe I shouldn't have gotten married in the first place if I really looked at all the signals, um, then I might just be making the decision to leave. And so I'm coming at it in a different place. I'm coming at one where I need almost healing work to be, to come up to the level of being okay versus I'm ready to start the growth journey and I need to look at my foundation. Um, So it really depends on where, where they are coming to me from. Well, let's take the example of someone who comes to you and they're looking at their relationship. They're fundamentally unhappy. They've been unhappy for a very long time, kind of had a feeling that this things weren't right on whatever level in whatever way, you know, that it works in their relationship. And they're getting to the point where 
they're finally wondering, is, is this it for my life or is right. there more? Right. So there's not, there hasn't been domestic violence. There hasn't been any kind of outright physical abuse may have been verbal abuse or, or what have you, which is still something to deal with, but fundamentally they're just, they've got that malaise that, right. this, that feeling that this isn't what I want. Um, but how do you help them figure out whether this is the marriage that they want or not? And then if they want a divorce, get through it and start to heal. I take them through an analyzing process, analyzing their marriage, analyzing their spouse, analyzing themselves. And once they have that fundamental knowledge of reality, then I ask them to tell me what is their ideal relationship? What does it look like? And then the next step is compare the two, compared to what I have to compare to what I want. How much of that is affected by me and how much of it is affected by him? So the malaise tends sometimes can come from fear, fear of making a decision. Um, the other malaise can come from uh, fear of the unknown. There just, there's a lot of things that can affect that. So really taking a smack dab, honest view of what you've got and what you want can really help you decide, is this, you know, is this something worth keeping and putting the work into? Um, because I see many of the things in my ideal, or is this something that's just so far out of whack and I'm not willing to put the work in to change? I think that last part is really the key, right? Because as we both know, things change doesn't just magically happen, right? You've right. got at least the positive kinds of changes that you're describing here, the healing changes, you've got to put the work in. And yep. if you can help explain to the audience, what do you mean by the work? What is the work? Well, the work are things like looking at all of your resentments and then looking at what part do you play in those resentments? They could be things like looking at your strengths and have you ever acknowledged your strengths and maybe you need to practice you know, praising yourself for things you've done. It could be discovering that you have some very deep seated childhood issues and traumas that need additional support from a therapist. It could mean that um, you finally realized what your passion is, but you're scared to try it. Let's say you thought a long time about going back to school or starting a business or becoming an artist, any of those kinds of things, but you felt either that you didn't deserve them, you didn't feel like you could do them, or you didn't feel like you had the know-it-all or the financial resources to do it. So there's all kinds of digging if you will. And it really is. It's like digging with a shovel or what I like to say, it's like peeling an onion and you discover things about yourself at different layers. What I discovered about myself 10 years ago is very different than what I discovered about myself today. In some cases, it's the same root problem, but dealing with it at a deeper level. In other cases, it's a whole different issue together. That makes sense. And in, in, in what you said, what I heard, the word that I kept hearing over and over again was fear. Yes. Fear the unknown fear of this fear of that fear. We're, we're all as human beings, we're hardwired to pay attention to fear so that we survive. So the question I, I'm curious about is, you know, what, regardless of what the fear is, how mm -hmm. do you help clients or what would you say to someone who is like, I'm just, I'm too afraid. I'm stuck. I'm paralyzed. Right. Well, we work through what's the worst thing that can happen. And then we pull back from that and say, what's the more likely thing that can happen? And then we say, what do we need for it to happen? 
And when you link those three, you can come up with, let's say, a to-do list. Now, the other beautiful thing about having a coach is having an accountability partner where I might have discovered some things about myself and then I'm going to sit down and watch TV for five days. But if I have an accountability partner, I'm going to say to you, okay, can you send me this by Friday? Can you send me this list by Friday? Can you send me this list by Wednesday? You know, and then in a coaching session, tell me your progress. Tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you're feeling. Are you still afraid? But the other thing I do in my practice is I measure their progress over time with their emotions. So we do an evaluation at the beginning of what their, uh, I'd say, level of emotions are. And then we measure it throughout their process so they can actually see the progress that they're making. That is brilliant. That I think, because so many times, I don't know, maybe it's especially because we're women, like I tend to discount the progress I make. Like you make the progress yes. and you go, oh, no, no, no. But I wasn't that bad before. I really haven't made that much progress, right? Yeah. So having an objective way to say, no, look, you really did is yeah. I think helpful. Well, think about it. How many of us really can take a good compliment and just accept it? There's something in our DNA. I don't know what it is about women either. We think we don't deserve it or whatever, but I think it's been passed down for generations and kind of ingrained. Well, we ne need to learn how to accept that and to move on and praise ourselves um, because we really are worthy. We are women of worth, grace, and dignity, and we need to start talking to ourselves. And that's kind of another issue, thinking about, you know, how we talk to ourselves versus how we talk to our best friend. And nine times out of 10, we're always much more positive and supportive with our best friend than we are with ourselves. And we need to change that. Of course. I think that, you know, so many of us are our worst critic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's a DNA thing or a socialization thing, which Could is be. also yeah. very, very possible that women are like you mentioned, even in the beginning, you were socialized to be the good girl, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that means not always being able to accept compliments, not always feeling your own power, so mm -hmm. to speak, you know, learning yeah. or, or, or walking in, stepping into your own power. So I love that, that. You can be the person you really want to be. Right. Yeah. And as both of us know, you know, the other part about attracting the partner that you want is being the kind of person who will attract that partner. Exactly. And there's a part of that where I had to say to myself, Beverly, sick people don't attract healthy people. Only healthy people attract healthy people. So what do I need to get from where I was to where I want to be to be able to attract? Instead of complaining about why there aren't enough men out there, <laughs> this is a brutal story. I called my girlfriend and I was complaining about why I wasn't in a relationship. And she said, Beverly, if you took the time that you spend complaining about why you're not in a relationship to become the kind of person someone would want to be in a relationship with, it will happen. And I went, ouch. But once again, whoa, what truth was that? What a great lesson was that? So they were these little, um, aha moments and gifts from people that might have come with pain, which by the way, I never seem to grow when life's just hunky dory and I'm happy. It's only through pain is my great motivator that then it encourages me to take this new path from divorce to a new and fulfilling life. Yeah. And you know that what you said is so powerful and important. First of all, that you had people in your life who were willing yeah. to see the truth. Yes. That's amazing. But that you had the courage to hear the truth is also equally as important because I think our natural tendency as humans is to throw up the shield and get defensive. 
No, no, no. What do well, you mean? Well, there was probably a little bit of that in there. <laughs> there yeah. was probably a little bit. But then, you know, you, you sit back and you go, hmm, she's she's happy. I'm not happy. Maybe she knows something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's about, I think, being having that you put it awareness. I call it openness to to say yep. maybe they're right, you know, and maybe the self-awareness to say maybe there's something, you know, if I've been through four husbands and I'm still not happy, what's the common denominator? Me. Absolutely. And then the flip side of that too is, so what's the risk if I try it, even if they're wrong, you know, what have I got to lose, you know, to try and be a healthier person, to try and be more attractive. And I don't mean that necessarily in a physical sense, mm -hmm. but in more an attribute sense of my personality. You know, if I fuss all the time, if I complain about ex-husbands all the time, if I am filled with anger and rage, who's going to want to spend time with me? Nobody. Yeah. So that's another thing that I think people forget in divorce is that after the divorce is complete, the emotions that you decide to store in your body and live your life with are going to be a reflection to the outside world. And that's going to be a function of who you attract and who you don't attract. 100%. And also <clears throat> a reflection of the state of your health. I know- yes. I I just heard from a former client, someone who um, I had worked on, you know, it, it was a guy worked on his divorce a decade ago, right? right. And he said his ex-wife just never got over it. She was yeah. bitter. She was angry. She was whatever. And she just died of cancer. Yeah. And I actually had, had a similar situation. I knew a woman that eight years after the divorce said to her ex, you haven't suffered enough. Two years later, she was dead of uterine cancer. Now oh it has been proven scientifically that stress, that divorce, that hatred and anger affect people physically. So not only are you going through this emotional upheaval, but also you're going through a physical upheaval that if you don't step back and realize that the only person suffering from your anger and rage is yourself, it's not affecting them at all. Yeah. In both of our stories, the ex-husbands are still alive mm -hmm. yep. and they're perfectly fine. So, you know, it's hanging on to those <clears throat> negative emotions. Ultimately, it's like, the, what is it? The Buddhist saying that, you know, holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Yes. Yes. I love that saying. I think that is so true. Yeah. So hundred percent. But how do you, when you're just so full of that emotion, you're so angry and upset about what happened. Maybe you weren't the one who wanted the divorce. Maybe there was a betrayal. Maybe there was, you know, an addiction. You're just, whatever it was, you're so angry. How do you let go? Well, that little sign you've got behind you where it says mindset plays a big, big piece in that. You know, the more science has shown that the more we think negatively, the more negative pathways we create in our brain. And the more positive we think, the more positive. And depending on how long and deep those are, determine what our instantaneous reactions are. Yeah. So a lot of it's going to be practicing shifting your thinking. You know, I was um, on with a client today who is in one of those places who has, you know, just been, you know, has been dealt a raw deal and she's having a real hard time getting over it. Well, you try and explain to her that the more you are consumed with it, the more your emotions are feeling it the less clear you can think and you probably can't think at all. So you can't make decent decisions for yourself, your children and your future. So what we need to do is we need to practice. And the next time you feel yourself 
getting angry and rageful at him. In other words, obsessing about him. I want you to go clean a drawer in your kitchen. Now that might sound silly, but it is literally shifting your mind away and becoming um, distracted by the other. Another technique is to visualize a room. It's a brick walls all around. There's a steel door with multiple deadbolt locks. You open that door, you throw your ex and your obsessions and your fears in there. You close that door and you lock it up. Then you have the power to decide when you open those up and let them out. So I'm not telling you, you can't let them out, but I'm telling you, I want you to practice putting them away. And it's those kinds of techniques you use to help them have some periods of time without that negativity or fear. And most of the time, when some people have the chance to experience peace, they're going to gravitate toward that. Yeah. If it, well, I should preface all of this. If somebody's willing to change, there has to be willingness in that. If their heels are dug in and this is what they want, then nobody can help. Yeah. You know? Heaven and earth and are maybe, not going to change them. Yeah. Maybe years later, they'll be ready. Maybe not, but they have to be willing to want to go on this journey. There was so much gold in what you just said, but one of the things that I really want people to pay attention to is that you said, you know, this may, you may have a hundred percent justification for being angry and upset. You may have been dealt a raw deal. Everything bad could have happened to you. All of that can be true, but you can still let go of it yes. because the anger and the pain, you know, at some point in, in my, the, the way I frame the world or see the world is in terms of decision-making and you have a choice. You can either hang on to that bitterness and be miserable or you can let it go, even though it was, you know, you're justified in being angry. You can choose to let it go or you can choose to hang on. Well, what you said earlier, it's only hurting you. It's not hurting them. Yeah. And letting go is the first step in recovery. And letting go has to happen before acceptance. And acceptance has to happen before forgiveness. And the true, true healing and the true, true joy is found in forgiving. Now, that is a tall order for someone coming through divorce. So what we do is we focus on the baby steps. We focus on the here and now. We don't worry about forgiveness right now. Maybe it's impossible and it may take you 20 years to forgive. But let's take a look at what the price is you are paying, what the price is your family is paying for what you're holding on to. And is it really worth it? Is it worth, you know, drinking that poison? You know, those kinds of things, because it just, it comes back to, you've got to realize that although that maybe that 30 seconds of, yeah, I'm going to stick it to him. That's going to be 30 seconds and you're going to deal with the residual for a lifetime. Yep. And it, it goes back to what you were saying before that you're the one who's paying the price all yep. along for weeks, months, years for 30 seconds of satisfaction. I mean, I guess some people would say it was worth it, but personally, yeah. that's not a price I'd be willing to pay. Yeah. Now here's where it gets complicated. If you're also then after the divorce and in a very difficult co-parenting situation where all of this stuff keeps coming up and up and up, it's going to be much harder because the negative pathways, the negative thoughts are going to, you're going to have new material as they say. So it becomes even more critical for you to desire or for you to set goals for who you want to be, you know, and a lot of people think, well, if I don't talk badly about my spouse to my children, then I'm doing good. That's what I'm supposed to do. But it's more than that. Children can read into body language. They can read into actions. They can read into tone. 
So it may not only be you you're hurting, it may be your children as well. Yeah, and I think that's something that's really important for parents to keep in mind. And so many times parents think, well, if I just say the right thing, right? Yep. I'm fine. But kids don't learn by what you say. They learn by what you do. Oh, what you do. Yes. You are so right. Absolutely. And that that makes a big difference. I, I have a question for you. Given all of your vast experience, personal <laughs> and professional, um, if you had to give a woman who is facing a divorce one piece of advice or a decision to divorce, one piece of advice, what would you tell them? Don't let your emotions hijack you. Process your emotions so that you can think clearly and make good decisions. Because if not, you won't get an outcome you want, or you'll wake up three to five years from now and go, oh my God, I shouldn't have done that. Or And even, this will affect you the absolute rest of your life. Even six months. I mean, once- Yes, that's true. Once your head starts to clear, I've seen this with so many oh, people. Oh, I bet you have. Yeah. They look back and they go, what was I thinking? Right? So it's all about dealing with your emotions so that you can think clearly. But that brings me to yet one more question, which is, yeah, okay, you're supposed to deal, you're supposed to process the emotions, but you're not supposed to make emotional decisions so isn't that, don't those two statements conflict? No, because I'm talking about processing the emotions so they don't run you. Doesn't mean you're not going to have emotion. It means they're not going to control you. It means that that rage isn't there for the moments you need. I use another visualization for clients when they're walking into a meeting with an attorney or a mediator or a parenting coordinator, that there is this box and they can make this box as beautiful and elaborate as they want. And it has a lid and it has a lock. And what I want them to do is open that box before they move into that meeting with the mediator or attorney or ex or parenting coordinator and put all of their emotion in that box shut it and lock it, walk into that meeting, treat it just like a neutral business setting. When they come out, they can take all of those emotions back out. Absolutely. And own all of them. But just for that one hour, just for that meeting, I want them to keep it in that box. So they make the best decisions for themselves. They can, because they only will have themselves to blame for poor decisions. True. And that is that is such great advice. And I just, I want to thank you for all of the wisdom that you have shared. And I know that you have an ebook that people can access. Can you tell me about that? Absolutely. It's an ebook about my personal journey and the shame I felt with multiple divorces. It also can be uh, read by women who only have one divorce, but are feeling shame, but it gives you a real insight into my journey and how emotions can consume you and how you can also let the judgments of other people consume you at the same time that to recover from that. That sounds like a really, really good read, a really oh, powerful book. Um, and, and where can people find you if they're interested in following up with you? What's the best place to reach you? You can go to www.herempowereddivorce.com. You can sign up for a free consultation just to chat with me about your situation. And there's a variety of resources there, whether it's my podcast episodes, whether it's under the resources tab, I have eBooks and different things as well. I have a blog on there. So there's lots and lots of information available to them. Beverly, you have been a tremendous resource for so many just in this podcast episode alone. I just oh, want to thank you. thank you, thank you, thank you. And for all of you out there who are listening or who are watching, if you like this episode, please give us a thumbs up, like, subscribe, and share. And I'll talk to you again next time.